Selamat pagi Bapak Ibu, selamat datang di acara pagi hari ini. Uh, sebelum kita mulai webinar pagi hari ini, saya akan membacakan mengenai uh, uh, fungsi interpretasi yang tersedia di webinar kali ini. Untuk para pengguna bahasa Indonesia, uh, Anda dipersilakan untuk klik interpretation, lalu pilih channel Indonesian, dan Anda tidak perlu pindah channel saat bicara, uh, pembicara dan interpreter masih dapat mendengar Anda. Pembicara sebaiknya masuk ke salah satu channel dan berbicara dalam bahasa Indonesia kalau mengakses channel Indonesian agar tidak mengganggu penerjemahan. Bila Anda tidak memiliki uh, channel ini, Anda diharapkan untuk mengupdate Zoom Anda ke versi terbaru. And for English speakers, if you would like to listen in English, please click interpretation and choose English. You don't need to change channel when speaking. Uh, the resource person then and the interpreter will be able to hear you. English speakers should go to English channel, otherwise uh, your your speech will overlap with interpreter. And if you don't have this feature, please update your Zoom to the newest version. Dan bagi Bapak Ibu yang menggunakan ponsel, fungsinya sedikit tersembunyi. Bapak Ibu bisa klik di more, lalu pilih language interpretation, Lalu pilih Indonesia untuk bahasa Indonesia dan English untuk bahasa Inggris. Inggris. Dan jangan lupa untuk klik dan terima kasih dari saya. Saya kembalikan ke Nizam. Selamat pagi and hello to everyone joining us for the Big Ideas Seminar today. The title of today's seminar is Healthy Skepticism, Stopping the Spread of Misinformation During COVID-19. Before we get started, I'd just like to go over a couple of things. As you may have just heard, this webinar will be conducted in English. You may have seen the slides earlier. Before we start, I'd like to ask all participants in Zoom to click on the interpretation button at the bottom of the screen and select a language. If you select Indonesian, you will be able to hear our interpreter over the audio of the speakers. You can switch back at any time. Please still click on English if you would like to listen in English. I will now pass to Shaje Defer, Alistair Cox, to give his opening remarks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dizem, for that introduction. Selamat pagi. Salam sejahtera bagi kita semua. Welcome to our final uh, Big Ideas Seminar for 2020. And thank you for joining us uh, and our four excellent speakers today who will be sharing their expertise with us. Did you know that eating garlic and hot chilli peppers can prevent you from catching COVID-19? or that taking a bath in very warm water can kill the virus, or that hand dryers are particularly effective also for getting rid of COVID-19? Well, of course, all of these statements are false, but they're examples of some of the misinformation that has been circulating both in the community and online since the beginning of COVID-19 earlier this year. The World Health Organization describes this situation as an infodemic. Uh, there's an abundance of information on the pandemic so readily available to us, and so much of it is plainly wrong. This is the first pandemic in history where social media and internet uh, is being used at such a large scale to keep us all connected, informed, safe, and productive. And they're the good things. Um, and while these all have great and obvious benefits, the technology also comes with downsides, which I think from the examples I gave you before, we're all probably aware of by now. Just as quickly as social media can distribute important health information messages, it can also be used to spread false and potentially dangerous myths. Misinformation can lead uh, to people not following government public health messages. 
It can also increase stigma and ultimately result in increased community transmission of the virus. Some of these myths can also cause physical harm to infected people by promoting incorrect and dangerous treatment options. In Indonesia, one survey found that 31% of people believe that COVID-19 is a global conspiracy and 10% believe that COVID-19 is not dangerous. In an Australian survey, 20% of people said they believed the threat of COVID-19 was exaggerated. Next year, 2021, the world will embark, and it already has started, as you know, on the largest vaccine program ever known. It's vital that people know the facts about the vaccines and have access to good information about them. But sadly enough, and I've been hearing reports out of you know, the United States, Europe, and so forth, already stories about the vaccines, often very wrong, are already starting to spread. Uh, to all of you, the, the downside of, of social media and the digitization of news is that it's difficult for anyone to control what information is uploaded and even more difficult to determine the source of that information. Too often these days, misinformation takes our attention and provides an environment where division and conflict can thrive. More and more people today are relying on their phone or another form of device to get their news. For a large group of people across the world, their news is delivered not by traditional news providers, but by Facebook or Google. 20 years ago, people consumed news more often via the newspapers, established radio or television stations, forms of media that had established traditions of fact checking, uh, source monitoring, maintaining, and these companies had a, a stake in this because they needed to maintain the reputation of their company as a reliable and credible provider of news. But these days, algorithms, which few people understand, populate news feeds of social media channels with one goal in mind, trying to make you click the next click to keep the app going for longer so that they can put more ads up for you to see along the way. These commercial imperatives run directly counter to what is in the public good. So being able to manage this infodemic, as the World Health Organization called it, is as an important part of being able to control um, the COVID-19 epidemic or many other uh, social or other community phenomenon that we face today. Politics too. Governments can play uh, a role by creating an environment in which informative, factual content is developed and widely distributed. But there are powerful forces at play on the internet that sometimes seek to influence community understanding of events and issues. That can be detrimental to people's understanding of important issues, such as how to stay safe during the COVID-19 pandemic. During 2020, governments, the media, civil society organizations and technology companies have all had an important role to play in trying to manage and combat misinformation and promoting information that is reliable and improves public understanding. I hope, finally, I hope all of you can participate actively today uh, in listening to our speakers who all have a wealth of experience uh, and uh, background thinking about these um, really contemporary and challenging issues um, and hope that helps you to uh, recognise, respond to and, where necessary, combat misinformation 
and get better uh, at spotting uh, when it is uh, being shared with us or when it is being used in our news feeds. Sekali lagi terima kasih dan saya harap anda semua menikmati seminar Big Ideas pada pagi ini. Selamat pagi, terima kasih. Thanks, Alistair. I will now introduce you to our speakers for today's event. Anita Wahid is in the Presidium of Mofindo. She was recently selected as an advisor for APEC content security for TikTok. As an organization, Mofindo are accredited fact checkers for Facebook and also work with Google on fact checking. Anita has been involved in anti-hoax activism for most of her career. Uni Lubis is Editor-in-Chief at IDN Times. She has extensive experience in journalism going back three decades. Under her leadership, the website of IDN Times has become one of the most popular in Indonesia. She was previously Chief Editor of Rapala Indonesia and ANTV. Dr. Greg Nilishi is Senior Lecturer in the Marketing and Management Faculty of the University of Melbourne. He has had extensive experience in advertising, marketing and business strategy in Australia, North America and Europe. His research interests include consumer information, processing and decision making, fake news, persuasion and attitude change. Dr. Anne Kruger is APEC editor at First Draft News Fact Checking Coalition. Anne has worked as a journalist for several media outlets, including CNN, Bloomberg, Radio Television Hong Kong, and Radio Corporation Singapore. She is an assessor at the international fact checking network Pointer and a Google News initiative trainer. She is a senior digital producer at the ABC in Australia and also lectures at the University of Technology, Sydney. Thanks to all of our panelists for taking the time to join us today. The first part of today's webinar will be a discussion with our panelists. We will then open it up for questions. If you think of any questions that you'd like to ask any of our panelists, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and enter your questions. We'll get to these in the second part of today's event. Uh, Tasfan, you can please put the slides on the screen. Okay, so we'll start with you, um, Dr. Ann Kruger, if you could just explain to us uh, what is misinformation and um, why we should be concerned about misinformation and also talk to the slides that you've also prepared about this. Fantastic, thank you very much. And um, I might just skip, uh, if we go back to the first slide. Fantastic. All right. Well, um, thank you very much uh, for the warm introduction. My name is Anne Kruger. I'm the director of First Draft in Asia Pacific. As you heard, I uh, spent most of my career working in Hong Kong, Singapore and Australia. And we have expanded into Asia Pacific after launching our first bureau in the region in Sydney last year. And I first became uh, in touch with First Draft when I was working in Hong Kong, in particular during 2014, when there was the protest there, Occupy Central protests, and we were looking around at a lot of the misinformation that was happening there. And we thought eventually someone will have the answers for us and someone will make sense of all of the misinformation we're seeing online. And after a little while, we realized no one has the answers for us. So um, necessity being the mother of invention, we decided to uh, look into this ourselves. And I came across the resources of First Draft and um, started to put this into a context for Asia and Asia Pacific. So for First Draft, misinformation is damaging communities around the world. And with our mission, 
We really want to protect communities from the harmful misinformation. We heard some examples of that in the introduction from Alistair. We were agile in our response to support journalists early in the pandemic um, with our resource hub, and we've swiftly been delivering things like online courses for reporters that are really focused on how to report on coronavirus. But everything we do starts with collaboration and we bring together a global network of journalists in what we call our cross-check network and investigate uh, and verify emerging stories. I check in daily with my colleagues around APAC and the globe and we monitor social media and closed messaging apps and we share this and give responsible reporting tips with our news partners as we look into the online narratives. We also consider what lessons there might be for our um, teams globally. So when you ask what is misinformation and disinformation, well, in 2020, we've seen it all. We've seen all the tools and techniques that have been used to spread the seven types of mis and disinformation that first draft um, refers to and that um, the table that we've put together that's been used widely by UNESCO. So misinformation, generally speaking, information that is spread by a mistake. People might be spreading information that they actually might truly believe in, but it can be harmful um, information as well. And disinformation, of course, is the much more deliberate uh, techniques that we see where people are actually trying to cause harm or discredit people or gain financially or through you know, other motivations such as uh, gain some more power. But I think with Initial misinformation globally on COVID-19, um, and we can scroll through, I think, to the next slides, that um, we trace that into four distinct buckets or themes, which first draft traced from the start. And so there's conspiracy theories about where it came from, misinformation about how the virus spreads, and false and misleading information about the symptoms and treatment, as well as rumours about how authorities and um, people are responding. So we might move to the next slides. And can probably, uh, yeah, and the next one after that, sorry. Okay, great. Um, so in Australia, we checked in daily with our counterparts in India. We actually had a, I've got a colleague there who's in Hyderabad with his family. He was actually in our London bureau, uh, went to visit his family early in the year. And well, as we know what's happened, people have um, been stuck in different places around the world. So we realised quite early though, when we were speaking to our colleague there, uh, there were a number of racialized narratives including in Australia, there was a strong anti-Chinese uh, narrative that was emerging. And my colleague in India noticed in particular uh, an anti-Muslim sentiment narrative there. So with this example, the World Pop Project at the University of Southampton published a study in February and estimated how many people may have left Wuhan before the region was quarantined. But when they tweeted a link to this study, they chose a picture that mapped global air traffic routes and travel for the entirety of 2011. It actually had nothing to do with the study. If you click in and read the study, uh, this picture that was used was really just taken out of context. And it turned into being referred to by the media as a terrifying map, um, you know, of where it's already spread now. And um, this was in the, in the early days. And it was picked up and reported on as such by a lot of different outlets, media outlets in Australia, in Britain, in New York and across the globe. Now, the World Pop Project deleted their tweet and um, well, deleted this um, picture that accompanied it. And the problem was, though, that the damage was already done. Um, and this just fed into that early uh, anti-Chinese sentiment in particular that, that we saw there. Dizem, did you want me to continue on with my... Um, um, yeah, so we've got, I think there's another two slides after this, if you could just um, talk to those as well, just with the examples yeah. sure. from social media. Great. Um, and so and another of the issues that we had was um, conspiracy theories and, um, you know, pictures that were taken 
out of context. So for conspiracy theories, we saw, you know, we've heard, and I'm sure you've all heard, that coronavirus was created in a lab by Microsoft founder Bill Gates as part of a globalist agenda to lower populations or by the Chinese government as a weapon against the US or even vice versa. One of the most damaging falsehoods came from a video of a market in Indonesia. It was posted online actually in June 2019. Um, and this video showed a range of wildlife and um, the only thing was though that um, as I mentioned the video was filmed in Indonesia had nothing to do with coronavirus and and what had happened was dozens of YouTubers had taken this clip and they'd removed the first few seconds which named the true location um, on the Indonesian island of Sulawesi and they'd added Wuhan market to it. Now, like many rumors, this was based on a, a kernel of truth. Yes, it's a market. Um, but for those that were debunking it, it was it was actually quite, um, you know, it wasn't a difficult one for them to debunk when you actually look at the differences between the markets. But for those that are scrolling across things in social media and getting um, things shared in their private chat apps, it's something that's um, perhaps a little bit, um, or, you know, people have to uh, use a bit of their media literacy and critical thinking to just um, look into it a bit more. But the problem was we were getting bombarded with so much information and everyone's getting bombarded with a lot of information. And remember, we're in a time of great unknowns and great fear. So this sort of thing took hold. Um, early in the year, it had 30,000 views and I last looked it had over 300,000 views and people are just starting to uh, share, conf uh, you know, spread confusion and um, misinformation this way. Great, thank you. And um, Dr. Greg, if you could um, talk to us about um, what's different about uh, misinformation in relation to COVID-19 compared to other topics. So, yes, I don't know if you can see me. I think on my screen is still Anne's uh, picture. Okay, now I can see myself. So, yeah, one question is why, why is there so much misinformation being spread on um, uh, essentially a science matter, a matter of um, something that's, um, that should be quite objective. Politics, of course, always has its opinions and as you can put all sorts of spin on political information, but why on scientific fact? And I was reflecting on this and, well, I guess it didn't take too long to realize that the reason why people um, spread so much information on this is, it is because it's very relevant to their lives. It has huge impact on people's lives and therefore, you know, any, any information that comes into that orbit then just gets people involved. The other part of it is that there's just a lot of uncertainty around it. It's a new virus, uh, although it's similar to previous things that we might have seen. And, you know, you could uh, create metaphors that it's like the plague or it's like Ebola or another, um, you know, the Spanish flu or something like that. And so then you can put that in a, sort of a mental frame of reference. But it is new and there's a lot of things that are uncertain about it and so um whatever you have you you have these two components of deep involvement and high uncertainty you will see phenomena like this and i also think that uh, unfortunately this phenomenon also got politicized and it became not just misinformation but disinformation as well and of course the difference there is that there's a malicious intent by some actors and they may be fringe groups or maybe not so fringe groups. They might be, uh, you know, political um, activists who want to spread um, their message, their view of the world. And they just use this as a pretext. Why does it work? Again, because people find it interesting. This is something that's relevant for them. There's quite a lot at stake uh, and not just in terms of their health or, or, or them being, um, you know, impacted by this disease directly directly, but also economically speaking, or certainly tied to some of their values. So I think that is uh, what made the info, the infodemic out of this, uh, which is on the face of it is surprising perhaps to some. Mm -hmm. um, Anita, we'll go to um, you now. If you could just um, talk to us just a bit about your 
um, activism work and how you've seen uh, misinformation emerge and develop. Yes, thank you, Lisa. Um, I think it's uh, it's pretty much how Dr. Greg, Dr. Greg uh, described it. Uh, it was the uncertainty that actually uh, uh, sort of incited hoaxes or disinformation and misinformation in the first place. If we look at uh, the COVID-related uh, hoaxes, I'm going to use the term hoax instead of disinformation and misinformation because, well, basically it's uh, how people in Indonesia respond better uh, to the term, to, uh, to the phenomenon. And um, yeah, I think at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, it's the uncertainty, the anxiety, the worriness that, that actually incited uh, the, uh, the hoaxes. And most of it because there is an absence of information. And if we see uh, in Indonesia, for instance, the way the government responded to it is actually only in the late February, they started to talk about it. And in March, they actually did something about it. But if we look at the uh, number of, uh, of hoaxes around COVID, uh, it actually started in January. We've seen already 19 uh, hoaxes related to COVID in January. And it grew uh, very significantly uh, until at least June, at least, I'm sorry, May. And then it, go, uh, it went uh, down starting from June. And, the, uh, and there's also the problem of... Um, well, Indonesia is a very polarized society, so there are actors that are actors that are actually using these uh, COVID issues as a way to um, attack one another. So it's it's not surprising if we take a look at the narration types of the hoaxes that has been spreading around that the two that are very most uh, that are most used are the boogies and the wedge driver. The boogies kind of uh, you know, uh, try to uh, try to sell that there is a fear out there that there is something that we should be worried about. And while the the wedge driver is when the information and the hoaxes were being used to actually discredit someone or uh, an organization or a certain uh, entity or vice versa, try to to make as if uh, someone or a uh, or, or or an organization or an entity looks much better than the reality. And within this polarized uh, society, there is also the problem of how, of how government handled uh, the situation because we've seen how the uh, paid buzzers that are pro the government, for instance, has been, they, are, they were very busy attacking people who are actually trying to get the message across that uh, COVID might be a threat for us so that the government would take uh, some action on it. And in the end, it created such mistrust, uh, such distrust towards the government. And by the time they actually did something, the distrust has been very high towards the government that it's, it's just too late for them to, you know, kind of undo that. And mm -hmm. from then on, it became kind of like a snowballing. And then the number of hoaxes had been increasing and increasing. And we've seen that in the first semester itself uh, of this year, we've seen that there, there was 519 hoaxes related to COVID, and most of them are politics. So it's 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 very uh, it's very um, uh, uh, I don't, it's very polarized. It's very it's been heavily used as weapon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. And um, Dr. Anne, if you could also um, talk to us a little bit about what um, disinformation is and how it differs from misinformation. Yeah, well, um, so so disinformation, uh, and it's it's been interesting because we've really started to fine tune our definitions this year. Um, so disinformation is very much um, information that's being spread on purpose. It's trying to disparage people. There are agents of disinformation that are motivated to share information because they they have an agenda. They want to create divisions. They want to, you know, get on top of that. They will use this fear that's happening at the moment to uh, for their own causes. And often it is uh, financial gain. Um, we're seeing that a lot with a number of the conspiracy theory and fringe groups. 
and they uh, have a mechanism to make money out of this. We saw a lot of scammers as well uh, that were getting involved and trying to make money. But also Mm -hmm. there's this motivation to try to get power, whether it's political power, uh, you know, it could be from propaganda, right through to um, being a part of, trying to be a part of a particular group. Um, you know, people will have a certain identity and they're really trying to push this cause and, and the ideology. And the issue with it is not really usually uh, because they have the best interests of society at heart at all. It's because there's their own gain and their own power that they want to, um, they want to achieve through these means. So when you've got a pandemic, when you've got a virus that there's a limited amount of information coming in, um, it's the prime type of uh, environment for them uh, to do this work. Mm-hmm. And in, in your research, have you seen uh, much of a difference in um, sort of different countries or is the, um, the type of content quite similar in different locations? Yeah, it's it's really interesting. So so we are seeing some differences and, and First Draft have just put together a large research research project around vaccines and we did have a number of um you know themes that we saw in common and you know that was you know looking at how vaccines are represented online you know in facebook and instagram twitter and we're looking at you know these two main themes came out of that you know and it was to do with um very much you know the i guess more the political side of things and the trust side of things as well but we did see in some countries, and in particular in some Spanish-speaking countries, that religion was um, much more important as well. There was a, a focus there on um, being protected by God um, and, and a, a different type of nuance there. But I would certainly say um, with the misinformation and disinformation that we've been tracking, there have been global threads throughout a lot of it. So in Australia, we saw a a big increase in the anti-vaccination community and uh, the the amount of followers that they got. And we saw that these were constantly interacting with the different chapters that they have overseas, whether they're US based or whether they're European based. And then we would see how that um, they would make connections here in, in Australia and throughout Asia Pacific as well. So the, and it's also interesting too that I find that in our part of the world we'll be looking at um, you know, different narratives, misinformation narratives, and we often we often actually start the narratives here more than we might realise, and then those narratives will get picked up overseas. So, case in point, um, recently we saw the UQ CSL vaccine trials ha- have been abandoned, and the misinformation that has come out of that. Uh, very quickly, uh, you know, things saying that, oh, that vaccine caused HIV. Of course, you know, we always see there's a kernel of truth in a lot of the misinformation and disinformation, um, but it gets completely taken out of context. And that uh, started here first in Australia, and then it was quickly picked up upon by a lot of the conspiracy theory groups overseas as well. Mm-hmm. And um, Uni, have you noticed any things um, unique to Indonesia in this space? Sort of any um, specific types of um, content or different types of um, misinformation that's been going around? Oh, you're on mute, I think. It happened. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, uh, I want to actually and agree, fully agree on the things that shared by Anita and uh, Dr. Anne and also Dr. Greg. I think in terms in term of the universal uh, perception on how the misinformation spread rapidly, especially uh, during the February in Indonesia, this March and April uh, on the earlier term of the uh, when the government start to, to act seriously handling the uh, COVID pandemic is uh, similar. The conspiracy theories, uh, how it virus spreading and then the health treatment, treatment 
and also stigmatization, xenophobia toward Chinese. Uh, that's also happened in Indonesia, even though some of the uh, cases, actually uh, the things that happened in India, for example, how the, the bitter juice, uh, uh, bitter juice, juice can cure the COVID uh, uh, virus after two hours uh, uh, consumed is also uh, uh, replicate and also republish Indonesia. So basically I can see that uh, most of the misinformation, including the Bill Gates conspiracy theory, it's uh, also spread in Indonesia. And uh, it's because, because this is a new virus, no one knows. So the anxiety and the uncertainty about pandemic uh, really can uh, become the uh, the entry gate for the misinformation. Uh, this is also the globally spread virus. So globally spread, spread information. I think this is something that uh, different uh, compared with the previous issues related with, for example, terrorism, polit politics, and so on. And for Indonesia, Indonesia is, uh, you know, we have, according to press council, we have 47,000 media. That included 43,000 online media. In one uh, district uh, in Sulawesi, there can be 500 online media. Everyone can set up the online media. So uh, without really uh, good knowledge, uh, basic knowledge, on how to do the journalism, good journalism. We are not talking about how to report about pandemic, which is everyone still on the, uh, especially in the, uh, the first month, still learning, including mm -hmm. journalism. Even applying good journalism is the problem. So the 43,000 43, online media, it's really a potential and it happened spreading the misinformation uh, regarding with the COVID-19. And also Indonesia, our social media user, we are uh, Twitter, our Twitter is, uh, uh, Jakarta is a Twitter global capital. We have 120 million Facebook users, ranked three after uh, uh, India and US. And nearly 66 million Instagram users, where the millennia is there. Uh, I didn't come is targeting millennial and Gen Z. And 40% population use WhatsApp, meaning more than 106 million. And we are in Indonesia and say that if, you know, this is a joke, it's sometimes serious and really dangerous for the misinformation spreading. What is the source of information that you, you trusted more? It's from group sebelah, you know, the other group, yeah? Uh, like, and the, the kind of misinformation spread is really quickly uh, in a family-related group, WhatsApp group. Yeah? Uh, so the, even the professor, doctor, the title is not, is not become the guarantee that you, you don't spread misinformation. Again, because for us, it's really a new thing. So everything related, this thing can cure. You can you can consume even the, the one of the mayor. I don't want to mention the name. One of the mayor, very popular mayor, uh, suggests to drink certain type of juice, yeah, the juice, and then she also order a lot of disinfectant chamber, yeah. Like hundreds of disinfectant chambers, so she can put this disinfectant chamber throughout the city. So everyone must go to these disinfectant chambers before entering the building. So, it's, so the the misinformation is not only coming from uh, not knowing people, but also from the from the government and also mm -hmm. from the people with the title. So this is, I think, uh, that happened in Indonesia during, uh, and uh, it still happens until now. I think the, 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 uh, the new data uh, that announced by the chief of 
uh, COVID-19 task force based on the, the survey uh, did on July, still 17% of people in Indonesia believe that they cannot, they cannot be contacted by this virus. Meaning more than 40 million people in Indonesia still believe that, even an, uh, uh, after six months of pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's very interesting, especially with the um, your comment about even um, government officials kind of making sending these kind of messages. Yeah, remember when uh, President Jokowi echoing uh, President Trump when Trump said that uh, chloroquine can cure the virus, and then at that time I remember that because uh, in Indonesia one of the so-called uh, uh, official source of debunking hoax is set up by the team in Ministry of Information and Communication. So every day they kind of like doing the debunking hoax. And then uh, that, that, that time, the min this ministry, because, because there is a news uh, spread globally that the, the chloroquine can cure the, the, the COVID, so the ministry said that this is hoax. They announced that officially in their website. And then Trump said that I'm gonna kind of like, this is okay. Then President Jokowi said, yes, this is can become the cure. And then the ministry actually uh, call, call, uh, call off the, the previous uh, post and say, this is okay. Even the Minister of Information and Communication kind of like revise the debunking hoax that they produce, uh, 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 particularly on the chloroquine things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, Dr. Greg, do you agree with the um, World Health Organization's assessment that we're currently in an infodemic? What are your thoughts on that? I think it's a good metaphor. And I think it captures the fact that it's, it spreads and it's sort of contagious in the sense that you get it and then you pass it on. Um, you know, I study the psychology, or I'm not an epidemiologist, so I don't know, you know, much about the actual physical nature of this virus, but I know quite a lot about how people process information. And I think there's two points to, to keep in mind of, in terms of how, you know, this process happens that people fall for misinformation. Uh, I, I agree very much with Juni saying that, you know, even top people who are in power could, could fall for it. Anybody can fall for it. And I think there's two, uh, two reasons for that. One is simply cognitive information processing. So information comes in and if it's ambiguous and it's complicated, some people may just not recognize that what they are intaking and then passing on is incorrect because it's not easy to do so. And, um, you know, some psychologists suggest that there's a two-stage process within this. First, any information comes in, you just accept it as truth. It's called the truth effect. So on the face of it, why? Because it's maybe evolutionarily or for other reasons, it was very sufficient for us to operate this way. Someone tells us something, it's sufficient for us to trust the person as a first instance. And then there's a correction phase. And often what I see is that people don't do the correction phase. Uh, they just take, you know, they just go by the gut. They take the initial impression that whatever information comes is, is just uh, correct. And then they pass it, pass it along and there's no correction. Of course, we have high standards in journalism for correction and certainly in science. We say, well, go fact check, you know, you go use your scientific methodologies to discern uh, the truth. The reality is that most people don't do these things, and it would be a really difficult expectation, I guess, on most on most people's uh, time and energies to do this process. So this correction sort of uh, doesn't happen. But that's just pure information processing, sort of cold cognition. It's just a matter of what the information, uh, whether the information is is correct or not, and then you process it. But there's another side of it, and that's uh, the motivational system. So next to the cognitive system in all of us, there's a motivational system that's composed of, you know, values, emotions, um, 
perhaps even subconscious, subconscious things that we find difficult to talk about. And unfortunately, a lot of these fake news um, stories speak to those. They speak to fears, they speak to prejudice, they speak to deeply held uh, you know, values. And so that's even more difficult to correct because it's not just a matter of whether the information is correct or not. It's a, it's a matter of whether it corresponds to some value that you hold or not. And I think, you know, you mentioned the soon to be ex-president Trump. You know, I think a lot of his supporters are not cognitively, uh, um, I guess, incompetent. That's not the point. They are not the deplorables as famously early Clinton said, meaning that somehow they are subpar uh, mentally. It's that they just have a certain view of the world and the information that comes from Trump and his, you know, his, his uh, uh, news sources that he uses uh, correspond to that. And so the simplest thing to do is just to say, well, it corresponds to what I want to hear and therefore I, I just accept it and pass it on. Now it's still strange to me to some extent why, how COVID, COVID got into this how COVID got politicized so much and things like, you know, wearing a face mask in the US, it's a political statement, whether you wear or not wear a face mask. Mm -hmm. It should be just a matter of common sense. There's, you know, and, and truly it's nobody's interest to spread this virus, right? And yet it has become a political statement. And I think that speaks to that motivational system that is in, in all of us. It has nothing to do with cold fact. It has everything to do with values and deeply held uh, emotions. And so to tackle this, it's quite hard, but any, any attempt to curtail this infodemic has to attack both of those systems, the fact, you know, the fact checking, the cold cognition part, if you will, but very importantly, also the motivational part of, uh, you know, what values people hold in relation to um, COVID. Or now, of course, it's the vaccine. So the next chapter in this whole story is now the vaccine. The vaccine yeah. is available, but some people will not take it. Not because they are ignorant or that they, they are low IQ, it's because their beliefs and their deeply held um, values somehow uh, contradict um, the notion of taking it. And certainly this information does not help that some uh, malicious actors intentionally attach certain value laden claims to something as simple as taking a jab. You know, so I think we we'll just have to see how this unfolds. I hope that, um, you know, most, most, even the most, um, you know, staunch uh, partisans for example, in the US would, would um, but again, this is just a hopeful academic speaking here. So I don't, I can't really speak to uh, what is going on in, on, on the ground level at the grassroots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. And so uh, Anita, what do you think are some of the ways that we can reduce or manage misinformation? Well, uh, as mentioned before by Dr. Greg, uh, fact-checking is uh, obviously very important. Uh, there has to be some sort of uh, valid information sources that people can rely on. And mm -hmm. also, uh, well, in this, in, uh, in this domain, unfortunately, um, of course, this is an uncertainty, uh, a time of full, full of uncertainty. So it's very hard to get to actually know which information is valid. To use the, the, the example of uh, chloroquine, for instance, uh, WHO has had stated in the past that there has been no evidence that it can cure uh, COVID. But several weeks after that, uh, there was a slight changes in the tone of the experts, not necessarily mm -hmm. from WHO, but there were actually experts, doctors, epidemiologists that actually said that, hey, there might be hope on this. So everything is always changing. And there's always a problem of making, of, 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 of verifying information. So which one is right? Is it, did it uh, cure COVID? Did it not? So the, the, this, this constant changing is always uh, one of the challenges. The second one is always about the authority that handles this information. Um, We've seen, for instance, 
from all the more than 700 hoaxes related to COVID that we've seen in Indonesia, mm -hmm. almost every month, the number of those hoaxes that were actually clarified by the authority were less than 17%. And that's a problem because they are actually the ones who have the authority. They, have mm -hmm. the, they are the ones who said that, okay, this is false, this is not false, this is valid. And most of them were clarified by either fact checkers or journalists. So um, having the authority to actually be involved in this fact checking is very important. Otherwise they will lose the, the, the trust uh, from the society. And another thing is that um, the government somehow doesn't seem to listen to the conversation that's been going on in the society. So they have this way of thinking that, okay, the society needs to hear this, we need to speak about this, but they never actually listen. What is it that the people believe? What kind of conspiracy theories that they were, uh, that, that, that has been spreading around in them? What kind, uh, how do they feel about vaccines? So government sent messages to people, but not actually addressing the, the, the concerns of the people. And that uh, creates a, a, a misalignment in communication. So um, I think, yeah, I think there has to be some ways that, that we can be together in terms of creating valid information that also address the concerns of the people. And so uh, Dr. Anne, would you have anything that you would want to add to that in terms of um, the role of the um, government and authorities and bodies like the World Health Organization? Um, yeah, I, th I think pro probably one, uh, one point I might actually just, just say is that with our monitoring, our daily monitoring, what we're looking at uh, are a lot of different groups on platforms. I just want to go back to um, something that Dr. Greg said about, you know, why, why are people not, um, you know, using their common sense, that sort of thing. And, and, you know, I absolutely agree. I think one thing though, that has been quite frightening for me is that I, I monitor these groups and how they have expanded. And so people get into, uh, and I know we hear talk about echo chambers um, and, and people, I think some of these groups have been like a, a gateway to begin with. So you might join a group, you might initially, be interested in, you know, getting some other information. But then more and more I've seen that a lot of the anti-lockdown groups are a catch-all for not just challenging the government, but they will incorporate anti-vaccination themes, they'll incorporate conspiracy theories, and there's a lot of confusion there. And I think, you know, with the US, um, the, the, the way things are structured there and the politics of it, is uh, it, it's very much your one side or the other and there's there's no in between. And the way I've seen the groups that are just, I mean, we were monitoring the election, the US election, and we had, you know, lists and lists of, um, you know, different groups, whether they're, you know, on the right or on the left. And the way that they're constantly pushing their, their own agendas and the way that they cherry pick the facts to look so convincing to people. Um, and, you know, it, it's actually frightening to see, you know, how convincing they can look, um, you know, the way that a president will roll out certain doctors in white coats that look like they are sharing legitimate scientific information initially, but then we find out later that, oh, look at some of the background and it's actually not so sound. So things do look really convincing and the average person just doesn't have time to sift through it. You know, it's, it's, a, it's very much been a full-time job for all of us who are verifying and the fact checkers and, and picking and choosing. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, yeah, in, in terms of, you know, the role of the government, I, I absolutely think there's a place there for them to support the everyday person with, um, you know, media literacy and to really support... Um, you know, how people can get their information and reliable information. We actually, with First Draft, we actually ran an SMS course that wasn't, it was, you know, normally we support journalists, but we actually quickly designed an SMS course in the US ahead of their elections to educate ordinary people, um, you know, just about things, you know, what, what to look out for. And we were overwhelmed at how popular that was. And we're now creating one for Asia Pacific. And 
to us, it was something that uh, I think the success of it was is because people can get it in an SMS on their phone. They can get it through their WhatsApp. You know, they're so used to stumbling upon their, this information anyway on their mobile phone. Um, you, you know, we've, we've moved on from when I was growing up, you would turn the TV on and watch the news that night. And, and you know, generally yeah. you had reliable sources. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the government really could be supporting that and also looking at how they can support the fact checkers and the journalists and support them in a way that it's sustainable because a lot of them are surviving on these annual grants um, and you know <laughs> that's not really sustainable and I know um, I hired a couple of um, you know staff um, in, in the second half of this year to, to help with the fact checking and the verification and it's really hard to find the right people that know how not to amplify the information they know how media can be uh, manipulated by agents of disinformation you know they're trying to get the media to report on this as well because then it, it, it lends some legitimacy um, they mm -hmm. know how to use all the tools uh, they know how to consider their own security and safety as well it's actually really hard to get those people they don't get paid that much really mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. but but by the time you get to a point where you've got the right people you've got the right team you're seeing the themes you've got the right networks you want to keep them for the long term and a lot of places um, you know, are really just, you know, do they have a five-year contract, a 10-year contract? I, I would be surprised. I think most of them it's, it's um, you know, incremental. So I think if the government can help support a, the media literacy of the people and get behind, you know, where we've seen um, the issues with, um, you know, a, a lot of media organisations have lost their um, usual revenue areas, um, if, if the government can somehow get behind a more sustainable um, support model, uh, I'm not saying that they're the only they're the only answer here, um, mm -hmm. but I absolutely think that's that's vital. Yeah, Uni, um, if you could um, tell us a bit about your thoughts in terms of um, the our media perspective to this and what you think the role and responsibilities is um, of media organizations. I uh, can't hear you. I think you might be muted. Mm. Uh, do, can you help? Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, okay. So uh, I fully agree that fact checking is uh, really important. So and uh, this is things that we we are doing in IDN times since we are targeting millennial and Gen Z. And as I said, uh, the millennials and Gen Z in Indonesia is probably globally also locked in Instagram and. So what we are doing is from the beginning is doing, we did a uh, 17 live Instagram on fact checking. So uh, uh, twice a week, yeah, started at March. Yeah, because as Anita said, from the beginning, actually it was media that start to do the education and the information regarding this virus. The government until about 26 or 27 February, still busy to, to promote the tourism because they said that because China is having problem, so the tourists will not uh, came to China. Let's do this. Let's try to attract the tourists came to Indonesia and they even uh, uh, prepare the incentive. So it's not in their, in their uh, 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 mindset to to do the preparation on uh, how the this virus can uh, infect Indonesian people. Even some of the ministers joking joking said that oh the virus cannot come to Indonesia because the regulation in Indonesia can kind of are very complicated. So it's hard for them to you know to enter Indonesian soil. Okay. So if this is this is the minister uh, that uh, that said that. So the media, included IDN time, uh, took uh, the role to uh, to do the uh, the banking hoax. 
uh, we did 17 live uh, Instagram, and also of course the the fact checking in article. Uh, IDN Times did 100 online activities in a month, meaning in one day we can we can do like two or three online activities from one only sources or channel. So it's really busy, busy month for us uh, regarding this virus in, in many various kind of topics. Of course, the health crisis is really important. The leadership uh, of the local government and then also the, in, the impact uh, on the business, on the uh, medium, uh, uh, SME, we also discussed that. Uh, and the science, science we, we always try to invite the science, the expert. The question is, which expert? Because some of the experts also become part of the government task force. And it's kind of like not transparent enough to admit if something wrong. So the tricky thing for journalists and media also, which expert that we can, we can, uh, we can uh, uh, use as an expert? independent, non-biased expert. This is also, also tricky. So this is the kind of uh, graphic that we produce regarding the, uh, regarding the virus. Uh, science and evidence-based resource. If you see uh, the testimony from the survivor is really important. We, we hope that because they, they, they already uh, contracted with the virus, they can share the exper uh, experience and also can give the trust. This is the mayor of uh, Bogor, Bima Arya. He was the first, he, he got uh, infected, I think, uh, in March or early April. So the first uh, uh, from the government side that, that got infected and announced uh, transparently, and also the other one. And the expert from uh, WHO, because we have Indonesian, become the senior advisor uh, in uh, uh, WHO headquarters. So she really kind of like become one of the most popular experts for Indonesian media. Uh, we also use uh, celebrities and influencers. We have this, uh, the celebrity twice a week uh, pro pro uh, pro program, live Instagram, and also invite the very uh, a famous uh, sports uh, in sport uh, figure, uh, and every time we also use this platform to educate, to inform uh, regarding this virus, and also the TikTok. So I the end time using multi platform in uh, distributing the content, including the COVID nineteen communication. So we we try to do our best, but. This is the, the journalist dilemma. I think uh, the info, whether how to informing the public versus steering fear. So the important that we did in the beginning is doing the the training for journalists. Uh, this is one of the very popular uh, epidemiologists, uh, Dr. Panduriono. We invite him to give the training for journalists how to cover the COVID, what kind of angle that, that we use uh, uh, to take this quite independent. And also we invite uh, several chief editor, women chief editor. This is this media lab did by uh, press council. So the training is really, really important in kind of like uh, uh, give the journalists included uh, media, media, in all of the media, uh, to how to cover the coffee and how to function uh, 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 better uh, as needed by the public during the pandemic. Yeah. Jason, can I uh, add a little something to how yeah, we've sure. been dealing with uh, misinformation and disinformation? Well, I've said about fact checking, and I think one of the one of the um, um, more important uh, parts of fact checking is not only about the fact checking itself, but about how we work actually together with the journalists. Uh, in Mafindo, for instance, have a, a, a collaboration with uh, twenty four online media throughout Indonesia, and also the uh, uh, Indonesian uh, Independent Journalist Alliances uh, to have 
together fact-checking platforms that actually help one another in providing information. And also uh, uh, the fact-checking network throughout the world is actually very important. For, for instance, in the beginning of the COVID phase, uh, there has been very strong uh, very strong collaboration between the fact checkers of Indonesia and in Taiwan, especially because there are a lot of Indo uh, Indonesian domestic workers in Taiwan who actually believed a lot of uh, hoaxes that were uh, being spread out in Taiwan. And uh, those, uh, those hoaxes were spread out in Indonesia. So the fact checkers of Taiwan actually asked us to help them, uh, to help them out with it. And that also had how it went with uh, fact checkers in Hong Kong and other places. Uh, so the networking itself is very important. And also I think, um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm completely agree with what Dr. Greg said about the motivational system. That has been one of the mo major challenges for us. So especially when it comes to uh, the motivation that is driven by the polarization. So in Indonesia, well, the polarization is more about religious and political polarization. So everything that is related to that uh, emotionally and perceived as a threat towards the, especially identity, is going to be uh, um, inciting the spread of hoaxes. And for us, it's it's actually the challenge to do public education, especially at the grassroots levels. That's why we've been working with um, uh, with other organizations, for instance, uh, and also local authorities, especially in the grassroots levels. Uh, um, to try to help the public on educating about the COVID. And there has been, there is an organization that is also working on literal, literal, digital literacy called Jap Lady. They have done really good, great job by incorporating the messages of, of health protocols and then translated them into more than 45 local languages and put them into posters and then print them out and then put them up uh, on public spaces like markets and bus terminals and everything. And that helped out a lot. Uh, those kind of, uh, uh, this, those kind of uh, uh, collaborations that we are talking about actually helped. And there was also one thing that we have started doing in the middle of the pandemic is knowing that it is always about the motivational uh, system and also the drive behind uh, keep behind the wanting to protect other people. And then uh, we become very engrossed in trying to protect other people from COVID. And we didn't actually think about uh, whether or not the information that we receive is true. And then we just kept distributing them. We started to work more on the public education, uh, public education side of critical thinking. We started about, um, about six months ago, uh, a program that actually teaches about uh, critical thinking to um, college lecturers and also school teachers uh, about more than a thousand uh, college uh, lecturers and school teachers in the hope that they will actually be the ones who help out in the grassroots levels. Yeah, that's my addition to that, the information. Yeah, yeah that's, that's if, very interesting. If I can add, can I add something to that? In terms of the sure. fact checking, I think fact checking is really good but I think it's probably better or more, I guess, important to pursue on the supply side. So certainly media organizations need to fact check and they should probably curtail access to information that's um, incorrect, which goes against, I guess, a little bit of free speech and other legal doctrines. But for the practical purposes, it's probably better if fact check the incorrect information is not then communicated on to end users. Um, and this is because after something gets encoded, research finds, uh, it's very difficult to correct anything. So once the fake news bit of information entered the system of an end user, so to say, it's really difficult to fact check it or correct it. It's just gonna stay there. So that means that if it was a virus, there's really no cure. It's just gonna stay in the system especially if it's tied to deep uh, motivational uh, systems next to it. So it's, I don't think it's ever just about that little bit of information that's out there. So fact checking a little bit of information, in my view for end users will never work. So what needs to be done is probably prior to that. So certainly media literacy education in general 
is important. It's important perhaps for people to to have what I called good information hygiene. It's almost like the hand wash. If you want to follow this metaphor of this is a, this is like a virus, then behave towards information like it's a virus. Wash your hands. That means check your sources or check the content from different uh, iterations of it and, and cross check. Uh, but but to, to assume that people would go to a fact checking organizations specific info content on that news story, I think that's not realistic and so therefore recommending that is is actually counterproductive so i think it's better to to um curtail access to, to for people to um to this type of information the, the one last thing i would say is that probably the goal also if we want to intervene and make the situation better is not so much to change people's beliefs about any of this content that's being spread online more to change their behavior to spread it on so it would probably have, uh, and in fact, there's research on this, that it would have a bigger impact to somehow stop someone from sharing information on rather than stopping that person, you know, personally believing in, or not in, in, in a piece of information. Why? Because of the virus multiplier, right? So if you spread it on, on uh, Facebook, then many, many other people will see. So if you just change the behavior of not sharing that fast by whatever means, if it's curtailing excess or crowding out with true information, I think that's what governments should do. They should just crowd it out with true information. And so then it's not really sustainable for people to uh, fill the gap with, with, with false. So there's just a few last thoughts that I wanted to share. Yeah, sure. And uh, I've just got a video that I'll just like to play now just about um, deep fake uh, content. And I wanted to get your um, thoughts on that as well, uh, uh, Dr. Greg, just about what you think the uh, implications are of um, this, this type of content. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time. Jordan Peele created this fake video of President Obama to demonstrate how easy it is to put words in someone else's mouth. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. Not everyone bought it, but the technology behind such frauds is rapidly improving, even as worries increase about their potential for harm. This is your Bloomberg Quick Take on Deep Fakes. Deepfakes, or realistic-looking fake videos and audio, gained popularity as a means of adding famous actresses into porn scenes. Despite bans on major websites, they remain easy to make and find. They're named for the deep learning artificial intelligence algorithms that make them possible. Input real audio or video of a specific person, the more the better, and the software tries to recognize patterns in speech and movement. Introduce a new element like someone else's face or voice, and a deepfake is born. It's actually extremely easy to make one of these things. There were just some supposed, you know, breakthroughs from academic researchers who work with this particular kind of machine learning in the past few weeks, which would drastically reduce the amount of video you need actually to create one of these. Programs like Fake App, the most popular and widely available for making deep fakes, need dozens of hours of human assistance to create a video that looks like this, rather than this. In August, researchers at Carnegie Mellon revealed software that accurately rendered not just facial features, but changing weather patterns and flowers in bloom. This advance is not yet available to the public, but with increasing capability comes increasing concern. You know, this is kind of fake news on steroids potentially. Um, we do not know of a case yet where someone has tried to use this to perpetrate a, a kind of fraud or an information warfare campaign, or, or for that matter, to really damage someone's reputation but it's the danger that everyone is really afraid of. In a world where fakes are easy to create, authenticity also becomes easier to deny. People caught doing genuinely objectionable things could claim evidence against them is bogus. Fake videos can also be difficult to detect, though researchers around the world and at the US Department of Defense have said they're working on ways to counter them. Deep fakes do, however, have some positive uses. Take Sarah Proc, a firm that creates digital voices for people who lose theirs from disease. Speech synthesis is the artificial production of human speech. There are also applications that could be considered either good or bad, like the many, many deep fakes that exist solely to turn as many movies as possible into Nicolas Cage movies. Oh, hi, Mark.
Yeah, so this um, <clears throat> you called me on this, so I'll just respond. I think the short term and, 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 and long term predictions are different than this one. I think in the short term, what we've seen so far, indeed, as one of the commentators said, that it has not been used um, with that much impact because there's a there's a simple method called cheap fakes. So if you if you have to think of the economics of the spreader of of, of misinformation, and I just discussed this with some counterintelligence uh, folks the other day, and they are telling me that it's much easier to make cheap fakes and it's much cheaper to create, for example, a video of Biden supposedly sleeping in the middle of a of a video uh, or a TV um, broadcast because you only need to edit the snoring noise with with some image of him closing his eyes. And so then you don't need AI um, or you know a lot of input information. Also the economics on the input video is such that it's, um, it's quite expensive to get on a target person enough video that would make uh, you know, the AI be able to run. The AI needs a lot of training data. And if you don't have training data of the person, it's going to be difficult to make something that is of the quality that would pass as real. But having said that, in the long run, this will change. The calculus will change. It will be easier to get um, uh, the technology to a level where you need less input video information. Maybe it's possible to hack into Zoom and get a lot of information on particular target individuals. Maybe the, the, the you know the price of, of getting these algorithms is, is, is going to be lower. And then I think we will have a truly difficult situation because people uh, are, you know, they are really bad at recognizing um, misinformation when when it's in, in in text when it's in a story where arguably it's easier and it's going to be very difficult to train them to detect this in video or images mm -hmm. i think we'll i'll um, just like to um, finish up the questions just with um dr ann kruger if you could just um tell us a little bit about um what what, what um viewers and uh, people that are watching about things that we can do to um, detect misinformation about how when we're um, looking at content maybe on social media or on the news, um, what, what are the things to look out for? Um, I think uh, always approach something with some scepticism and, and ask what's the reason why someone has sent this? Why, why is this being shared to me? Um, what's the motivation? I think that's the, the good first step. It's like who has sent this and why? Because I'm, we've done a lot of work into the psychology of misinformation and um, we keep that updated as well as to, you know, um, you know, there are certain ways of writing debunks that will actually unfortunately only just reinforce um, beliefs and, you know, and you know, if you're going to um, do a debunk, you, you're creating kind of a, an uncomfortable situation for people when they're believing this information because if you're going to take away some information that they don't believe you've got to really approach it in, a, in, a, in the right way and quickly put the correct information in for them in a way that they they understand but because i'm probably preaching to the converted here today um and and and, and educators here it would definitely my starting point is always to look at who has sent this have they got this information you know where have they got this information from if it is someone in my WhatsApp group that I know really well and I trust and um, I think, you know, they only have good intentions to send me this information, that's not enough, unfortunately. Um, and that's why a lot of people will um, fall for the information and share the information because it's been sent to them from someone they know. But where did that person they know get it from? And, and if you can't find that out, if you can't figure that out, then you're best to just leave it alone and um, then search to reliable areas of, um, you know, looking up more, more information about that particular topic. But for me, it's definitely looking at, you know, asking that question, why, what's the motivation? And then I really look into the profile of the person that sent it. And I try to keep, you know, doing those, those backward steps as to, well, where has the, where's the information come from? Where has it originated? And just some um, quick, 
uh, skills that you can that everyone can learn to do now I think is a reverse image search and you can do it now on your mobile phone a lot easier than we could before use use either Google or use tin eye reverse image search have a play with that and just see well where else have these pictures come um, on online and a lot of the time we'll see that there is um, you know photos that are being reused from a couple of years ago. Some of them do the rounds every five years. You see the same things come up again. So um, they, they would be my main main areas now. And I think it was, um, for Myanmar's recent general election, it was quite encouraging to see that Facebook had a temporary measure there in that they anyone that was going to share a photo or an image, you had to include some context um, around it so that you so that people would sort of know well you know what's the original image when is it from um, mm -hmm. as a and and I as far as I know from the fact checkers I've spoken to there that worked really well so I think you know people can think of that themselves so the motivations think of the source and do a couple of quick tools yourself like reverse image search um, that's a really good starting point. Mm -hmm. And um, Anita, was there anything that you could add to that? Want to add? Yeah, it is that. I think um, acquiring verifi uh, verification skill is important. But I think uh, from from what we've observed from the past two years, it seems that it's not about the verification skill that is lacking. I mean, a lot of people have awareness on the problem of hoaxes, and actually, they understand that the importance of fact checking. Uh, and Mafindo has provided a lot of a lot of tools to actually fact check everything. Uh, we've had um, 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 mobile apps. We have a hoax database that people can use. We have Facebook forums. We have everything that we have debunked in every social media channels that we have. We have a chatbot for WhatsApp. So basically, everything that people need to fact check information is out there. But what what we've seen is actually uh, if Anne is speaking about. Uh, why don't you ask about what's the motivation behind this information? The, for us, the problem is how, how to instill the motivation for people to actually willing to check the information. That's actually the major problem because people have the verification skill but not necessarily willing to check the information. And that, that's one of, the, one of the challenges that we are trying to face. That's how that is also one of the things that we are stressing out whenever we do public education on the important it is and we are trying very hard to formulate uh, the uh, um, the curriculum or the message that we are trying to put out there with the public so that they are willing to fact check whenever they see information. Thank you. And so now um, we'll um, finish up with my questions and we can open up to um, questions that we've received um, from participants. So we've got one here from uh, Juanita Amirian. Uh, I think this one um, would be a, a good one for Uni. So um, just about um, how um, uh, journalists, um, I guess the um, working environment now with the drop in um, advertising revenues and uh, news organizations getting more limited staff, um, what that means uh, for uh, media organizations and um, their, their ability to continue to circulate um, reliable and accurate information. I oh, can't hear you, Uni. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is, I think this is a problem. We have the WhatsApp, WhatsApp group that comprise about 50 uh, chief editors. And also I'm the chair of Indonesia uh, uh, Women Journalist Forum. So uh, this problem is really happen. I mean, the media is affected, even though not many people kind of like care about us included the government, but in terms of business and operation, we are suffering like other uh, uh, in this uh, industry sector. And th this can affect to the capability to do the training, uh, preparedness for the journalists uh, to cover that, 
because especially for the digital media, the algorithm, algorithm, you know, the 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 temptation to get the traffic is there to get the adsense because because the revenue from the from the advertiser is going down and 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 all the media get affected, included the power big powerhouse media. So for the the mo the majority of digital media, which I mentioned, like thousand of them, the AdSense is is the the one of the potential source of revenue. So the clickbait kind of article that have by the algorithm of the uh, platform, I mean, like the platform can help to train, yeah. Some of the big platform uh, help train the journalists in Indonesia through the association and also directly to the media to kind of like to do the fact checking, uh, the image fact checking. But I think they also responsible because their algorithm actually can put the misinformation based on the keywords that are used by everyone, including media, to spread quickly. So it's a, it's now it's a really difficult situation because uh, uh, the the business situation it, uh, it affect how the media can better prepare and uh, the, uh, the their newsroom to do the good journalism work, the one that really really needed during this crisis pandemic. The, the other thing, uh, the, the, the last thing is, that's why I agree that uh, the media literacy is, is really, really important. I, and I don't see that Indonesia government use this momentum, super big momentum, to put the digital literacy, not only media literacy, because now uh, there is an acceleration on digital during pandemic as part of the mandatory curriculum. Indonesia is the only country first year in ASEAN that haven't put this thing in the curriculum. My sons uh, 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 enroll in the private, uh, private uh, school. He got that. But most of the students actually in public school. That's not the mandatory. And this pandemic should become kind of like the big momentum. I mean, this is this is something that should be big and should be radical change, including included putting this in the curriculum. Because even though according to survey during the pandemic, survey done by the the national COVID task force, still sixty seven percent of the public, the respondent, I mean, represent by the respondent get the information from the media, in this case, the mainstream media, so it's quite okay, but it decrease, decrease, decrease. So if the media, the capability of media to, to spread and to function uh, well, it's also become the challenge, that is the problem for, uh, 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 for, uh, for this, uh, uh, how the media can can play an important role in curbing the uh, uh, misinformation. There are also one uh, survey that stated that actually the information, not many people, less than 30 percent, this is done by the academy, uh, less than 30 percent of Indonesian people access the information from the official government website on COVID-19, you know. So as a, because from the beginning is this trust will be, or uh, uh, the other, the other uh, reason is, it's not really informative, not really informative. Uh, the, the, the one that, that they provide during the, during the, uh, uh, on the, the official website. So aside from the role of mainstream media that try to do the good journalism plus additional capability to cover the pandemic, which is the first thing for almost all of us, 
we also now try to uh, uh, try to influence so we can get the wisdom of crowd from Indonesia social media. I mean, people like Anita and other other uh, other uh, figure in social media that has a lot of followers and influence. We always con, uh, counting on them to kind of like doing the wisdom of crowd, debunking the misinformation. So uh, yeah, this is we still uh, on the uncertainty period of time. <laughs> yeah, and I will just um, go to um, just some speech before we finish up. Let's go to some slides that um, Dr. Anne. Uh, supplied just about um, the comments that she made earlier about how to detect misinformation. And so um, just um, finish up there just because I'll have just had a look at the um, questions and the other questions are pretty much um, what we've just discussed um, earlier within the questions with the different speakers. So I'll just like to uh, thank our uh, speakers for taking the time to join us today and thank you also to the audience members who submitted questions and for everyone who um, joined in the discussion on Zoom and watched along on YouTube. I look forward to seeing you all again in the new year for uh, more topical uh, big ideas uh, webinars. You can see just the, and Dr. Anne's um, top um, tips on the screen there and um, yeah, so thank you again um, for joining us, uh, Terry Makasi, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Terima kasih. Thank you. Thank you. And Greg, Anita. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.